I'm Hannes from the V8 team. I'm working from the Munich office where we wear these funky hats every day at work. Um, and this talk is about our latest and greatest optimizations um, to reduce memory consumption and uh, latency in Chrome and V8. Um, in the beginning of my talk, I will introduce a few metrics uh, and trade-offs uh, where we are optimizing for. I will show you how garbage collection works in V8 from a quite high-level view. And then I'm talking about the three deadly sins of garbage collection, basically things you should not do. Um, after that, I'm going to talk about the main optimization I'm going to present this in this talk. It's idle time garbage collection. And maybe this optimization makes it less likely that you fall for any of these three sins I explained earlier. Um, quite some people were involved in this project, like the whole V8 garbage collection team, Ulan, uh, Jochen, and Michael. And the cool thing about the project really was that it was actually a multi-team effort within Chrome. Uh, the Blink scheduler people were involved and provided a nice platform of idle tasks like Ross and Sammy and many others, I guess, on the Blink scheduler side. And it originally started out with the compositor team with uh, Manfred, where we worked together and made that happen. Um, this project um, started actually about a year ago, a little bit earlier, and um, I will present several results during this talk. Let's start out with the trade-off space. Um, what we really care about is to provide 60 frames per second, which means each frame has 16.66 milliseconds to get all the work done. Ideally, we don't have any garbage collection pauses um, during these frames, right? But we kind of have the feeling that, well, if the pauses are below 6 milliseconds, we in many cases, or in most cases, do fine, but ideally it would be like zero. So to get there, JavaScript has to execute really fast. So we want high throughput from the JavaScript virtual machine and basically no uh, interruptions, no interference from the garbage collector. To get no interference from the garbage collector, you could basically turn it off, right? But then you get a problem with memory. So you once in a while really have to look at your memory and free up what is unused. So memory is an issue, right? And like a new thing that is coming up, a new metric where we also want to optimize for is battery. So we have this huge trade of space, four dimensions. It's really tough. Sometimes if you optimize for one dimension, you're going to do a little bit worse than another dimension. And then you have to make a good call and have to, have to take the tankage on some other metrics if you see that overall it's a big win to do better on another web, uh, metric. So overall, life is hard and complicated in a highly optimized uh, VM. How does garbage collection work in V8? Um, the V8 garbage collector regularly interrupts uh, JavaScript to free up unused memory, and uh, we implement the generational garbage collect uh, architecture. That is a very common thing what you would implement in a virtual machine. It's based on the hypothesis that most objects uh, die shortly after they are allocated. Um, we have a relatively small young generation. It can be up to 16 megabytes, and it uses a semi-space scavenger which basically only touches live objects. I will show in the next slide how that works on a really high level. Um, the cool thing is, if the hypothesis holds, these young generation collections will be really short and efficient. Not more, they usually don't take more than a millisecond. If, it, if the hypothesis doesn't hold, um, they can take longer. Um, turns out, for many, many applications and many websites, it holds. So uh, we are fine. The architecture is good. Um, the large uh, old generation can take up to 104 gigs. This is where objects get moved after some time, after they are alive for quite some time on the V8 heap. There we use a mark compact collector, which basically marks first the whole transitive closure of live objects. We do that incrementally, which means that once in a while we stop the main thread from executing, do a little bit of marking work, and then resume the main thread and let it continue to execute JavaScript code. We perform concurrent sweeping, which is basically the task to free up unused memory. Concurrent here means it runs really concurrent to the JavaScript, to the main thread. And we perform compaction to really limit the degree of fragmentation in memory. Um, the, a large uh, garbage collection touches actually the whole memory, the whole committed memory, everything that was used now uh, in the heap, which is alive and dead. So this, the whole work there, uh, can take quite some t um, some time, and the more memory you use, in general, the longer it will take to collect garbage there. So what's all this semi-space scavenger and old generation thing? How does it work on a really high level? 
Semi-space scavenger means the young generation is basically split up in two spaces, and one space is basically unused. So when we allocate now in the young generation, it's really fast. It's basically just bumping up a pointer, and objects get allocated from the bottom to the top. When we reach the top of the semi-space, basically the end, this is where the young generation kicks in. It cannot allocate anymore. What happens then is it visits all the objects that are still reachable, basically live in the young generation, and as it visits the object, it copies them over to the other semi-space. This is where the, sem the second semi-space comes into the game. And while it's doing that, it finds a few live objects. It doesn't touch the dead objects. And when it's done, it resumes the JavaScript execution. Objects now get allocated on top of the moved objects in the other semi-space until we hit the limit again. And then objects that already were copied once are now propagated to the old generation. And overall, there shouldn't be many. For each scavenge, maybe a few objects will survive and finally end up in the old generation. All the others in this case die, and semi-spaces flip their roles again, and uh, execution continues. So slowly, the old generation will fill up until a certain limit, and this is where then the full garbage collection with marking, sweeping, compaction will kick in and will make sure that the whole memory gets collected and compacted. Um, how does this look like? when we now take the whole JavaScript execution time from left to right, we will get like many of these small scavenger events if most of the objects are young. It's usually between zero and 10 milliseconds. Can take longer if the application is not well behaving, but usually it doesn't. Um, after many scavengers happened, we saw like eventually objects propagate to the old generation. And this is then the po uh, point in time when we start incremental marking. So when the old generation reaches a certain size, we start these incremental marking jobs, which regularly interfere the main thread, try to mark a few objects of the uh, whole transitive closure of live objects, resume them with the main thread. In between, a few scavengers may happen. And then at one point here, um, we, are about to, we are about to finish like the whole marking job. The mostly of the transitive closure of live objects is marked. And this is where we finalize this garbage collection cycle. This is the point where we really know what's live instead. We start the concurrent sweeper threads. We perform memory compaction. Um, this may take some time. It's usually 4 to 40 milliseconds. We're currently working on to get this pause even shorter, like 6 milliseconds or something would be ideal. Um, the bigger uh, your heap, the longer this time will, uh, it will usually take to finalize the uh, full garbage collection. And after that, execution continues. We'll see again more scavengers ev events. There can also be like really full garbage collections, basically without incremental marking. They can take significantly longer, up to 100 milliseconds. Um, you usually should not see them when you are in the critical latency critical part of a web page. If you encounter them, please file a bug for the V8 team. That should not happen on a latency critical path. Um, so how does the whole heap growing garbage collection triggering mechanism work? For the young generation, we already saw it. Whenever a semi-space fills up, this is the trigger for the young generation. For the old generation, it's a bit different. We set basically a limit. The limit will of objects that got allocated in the old generation. When we reach that limit, this is the time when we trigger basically incremental marking. And we base that limit on a growing factor that is chosen based on various heuristics, for example, the allocation rate. So what usually happens is at the end of, a, of the finalization of an incremental marking cycle, we know what was live, and we multiply the live memory bytes with a given factor, which will give us the growing factor. And this is basically the space which we have until the next garbage collection will trigger. OK, if there are any questions about that, you can please interview me now or uh, ask after the talk. Otherwise, we move on to the three deadly sins about garbage collection or frequent requests we get from users or developers. Um, should you use object pooling to avoid garbage collection? I think, no, you shouldn't. <laughs> um, why do you user want it? Well, th the usual argument is because I know the fact that garbage collection is slow and it will chank and it will be all terrible, so I'd, I'll just try to avoid allocation. Well, that's a good point. but. Um, it's actually a really bad idea. It defeats a bunch of optimizations we do, um, especially if you're familiar with escape analysis, allocation, folding, white barrier elimination, 
defeats the generational hypothesis, um, long story short, it will make your code slower. Um, many times, well, if you see that, well, object pooling would have, he pooling would have helped, I usually end up moving the CDGC, moving a lot of these objects. It could be a bug in the compiler in V8 or a feature which is not there yet in V8. So, as, but if you implement object pooling, if the feature gets landed in V8, you will not be able to take advantage of that feature. So as soon as V8 rolls out with maybe two of N, a better compiler, which will be way smarter about optimizations, you, your code base will stick to object pooling. And all the others that were not uh, pay, um, betting on object pooling and did the right thing and just allocated object will take advantage automatically by this optimization and will benefit immediately of that. So you shouldn't go there. And in the end, in the application, what you end up is like with a malloc freestyle system. You end up managing your own memory, which is usually not a good idea. Sin number two, can I turn off the garbage collector? No, please not. Why do user want it? Well, similar motivation. You know, you're going to do execute now a really time critical phase in your application, right? You want to get your rendering job done. You really don't want to have your GC now happening because you saw it in the past that you missed some frames and you saw chunks there. Well, good idea. You could turn off the GC. You would for sure not get the GC in your way now if you do that. But actually, it's quite difficult to maintain. Maybe it's okay like in the first version where you launch it out, but as your code base grows, it gets more and more complicated. It's also complicated to support it from a VM side, not to get GC because of a lot of optimizations we have for the allocations. Um, and you will end up with out of memory bugs and they will be really hard to track down. I mean, if you forget to turn it on again or you have a branch where you're not turning it on, uh, you may have a really bad time. Sin number three. Can I explicitly invoke the garbage collector? They used to do it in Java for some time. And already in Java, they found out it's a, it's a really bad idea and made this system GC call basically a uh, no op. So, no. Why not? I mean, I really would like to do it now because I know that later there will be a time critical phase. So, if I do GC now and I have time now, um, later maybe I may be lucky and don't get the GC chunk. Or, well, my memory consumption is really high. so. I really want to regularly trigger that GC manually to make sure that memory consumption remains low. These are the main arguments I hear from that side. All good points, but if you do that, you're going to confuse the hell out of the garbage collection heuristics and it will be completely off and you will, will end up with, a, with really bad performance. And on top of that, if you invoke the GC, well, you will probably get one of these full garbage collection events, which may take 100 milliseconds or even longer. And you may, because you don't know how long it will take, you may miss a bunch of frames with that. So, also not a good idea. But, you know, I'm just saying here, no, no, no. Um, and um, don't like all these great ideas, but how can we really help you? Okay, let's take a step back and look at Chrome, what's going on here. Um, this is a typical window, what I have, right? I have a ton of tabs open. There's one tab I really care about. This is the foreground tab. And this is the, really the only tab where, where latency matters, right? Here I really want this 606 milliseconds, 60 hertz frame rendering, um, when animation scrolling happens. But if nothing is going on there, well, this is then the, actually the time when I want to get rid of memory, when I want to shrink down my heap. Um, and then there I have these trillion of background tabs, which I probably opened days ago, I never look at. And these are the tabs that should really shrink, right? These are the tabs where I probably never care about them, but yeah, um, still good to have them around, but they shouldn't use a lot of memory. So, idea, um, let's make garbage collection invisible. And actually we had the idea before Rick Hudson at the Go uh, GopherCon gave the talk and he put it up as a joke, but this is what we started really doing. Um, he suggested, well, make two garbage collection when nobody's looking and right, yes. So this is basically the idea. Do garbage collection when we have idle time. And within Chrome, we actually know a lot about time. Um, so let's look into latency first. Let's see how we fix latency if we would know when, when there is idle time and when we could scale garbage collection there. So this is a very simplified picture of what's going on in Chrome, right? The main thread and composite are very simplified. Everything abstracts away. Um, this is a good case here. We execute some JavaScript, then tell the compositor, we are done, compositor is doing his magic. And before the frame ends, 
we finally draw and everything is good and we had a huge chunk of idle time there we'll come to back we'll come back to this later but what if this terrible garbage collection happens right it basically what might happen is it pushes everything to the right the handshake with the compositor happens later and unfortunately drawing happened too late and we missed the frame too bad but what if let's look at more frames like this is the missed frame we saw right there but we saw like before there was a ton of idle time right and the gc happened right there and there was so much time before where we didn't do anything what if we could schedule garbage collection before like what if we would know how long garbage collection would take we would know that um, garbage collection will happen soon why don't we take advantage of that and if we would be able to schedule it before everything would work out great and no chunk, no missed frames everything awesome all right that's the idea so for that, we need quite some instrumentation in V8. We basically need to know for each garbage collection event how long they take. So what we did is we started to measure. Whoop, something bad happened. There we go again. So we started to measure all the garbage collection components. Let's switch back to the slide before where I showed you scavengers, incremental marking events, finalization of incremental marking events. We basically started to measure how long they take and basically came up with a with like performance counters tell us this is how long scavengers took on average per megabyte of heap this is how long marking takes on average per megabyte the same for the finalization and we saw that like websites are have like quite some regular behavior in like how many objects survive how many objects become dead so um, the average there turned out to be a really useful number and with that knowledge um, we can also calculate when will the next garbage collection happen. So if we see a, a steady scavenging speed and uh, with, with the allocation rate, we will know like, well, in 20 milliseconds or in 100 milliseconds, there will probably be the next scavenge. We have now some idle time. So if we have idle time, please do it now. Um, so we started registering. This is like how it works now. We register um, idle task with the Blink scheduler and a garbage collection top and say, well, if you have some idle time in the near future, please call us back. We got some work to do. And the Blink scheduler will call us back. And it can give us up to 50 milliseconds idle time, depending on what's going on. If there's constant rendering, it will be up to 16 milliseconds. Um, if there's more time and there's less rendering pressure, uh, the Blink scheduler gives us up to 50 milliseconds um, with the idea that um, there may be other important input events coming in and um, we don't want to basically be in their way. So that's the idea, um, and that works out really great. We started the project, um, and the first system, I think, landed in M38. Um, this is where we hooked it up together with the compositor. The compositor had a global notion of idleness within one frame, so it know like, oh, rendering was done early. I have now some idle time. And the compositor continuously called V8 and was like, I got some idle time, do you have anything to do? Um, this was uh, pretty wasteful, like quite some overhead went there in the frame rendering. Um, and it just had a notion of maximum idle time of 16 to 6 milliseconds. I didn't know about the whole system. Um, so the system became really awesome with the, when they landed the Blink scheduler. And the first version there in M41 basically took the same model of like continuously calling V8 whenever there was an idle task, so the Blink scheduler respond uh, all the time a new idle task. Um, in that sense, it was still wasteful because V8 got called many, many times, and most of the time there was not much work to do or nothing to do. But uh, there we were then able to actually have get a better picture of what's going on in, in the system and got up to 50 milliseconds idle time. And recently in M45 and M46, we switched the model completely away from these wasteful models of getting uh, called all the time um, to we call VA, uh, the Blink scheduler and ask it for, hey, if you have anything to do now soon, please call us back. And that, that put a lot of pressure also from the system. So this is how it's used right now um, in Chrome. Um, nice results to demonstrate. Um, it's actually the old online game where we optimized a lot for. Um, this is a comparison between M41 and M46. I'm not sure how smooth it runs YouTube and the old video processing at some chunk, but it's clearly visible in M41. We got some chunk there. 
there were also some other optimization, uh, especially um, together with the whole error buffer, uh, targeting the error buffer work, which significantly, significantly reduced the chunk here. But if I look at M46 and disable V8 idle task with a flag and run the tip of tree of M46, the latest version, um, what I see there is like, um, when I disable it, I get this regular garbage collection events. They're just called allocation failure. This is basically a failure when you try to allocate on top of the semi-space and cannot allocate anymore. And they are get pretty big, right? 20 milliseconds, 50 milliseconds, which means basically for each of these, you get a missed frame. If I look at M46 with the idle tasks, all of them happen during idle tasks. And they're pretty small. So we, we scale the idle task early enough. Our online is allocating a lot, so we try to interfere. Um, sooner than later and ask for idle time and to get uh, garbage collection done. What's the impact on the, uh, on the rendering? Uh, we improved the frames per second by 2.7% on the benchmark. That doesn't sound like a lot. For frames per second, it actually is a lot because garbage collection is not happening all the time, right? Most of the frames uh, happen without garbage collection. So the impact there is quite significant just by making garbage collection uh, smarter. And frame time discrepancy, a metric to really quantify chunk from a user perspective, improved there by 44%, uh, which, is really, which is really nice, just by turning on the feature on the M46. Recently, we landed a, a bunch of uh, infinite scrolling benchmarks on the perfbots. They are super useful for us, especially for garbage collection. You really want your benchmarks to run for a long time generate really a bad state in the heap, right? If you just start up your browser freshly, do a little bit of work and shut down your benchmark, it's not going to be a very interesting workload. So what happens in these benchmark is we looked for um, widely used infinite scrolling websites and scroll them for 30 seconds to really get some interesting work going on to really trigger um, a significant amount of garbage collection events. And what we see there is like on the x-axis there are different websites on the y-axis is like garbage collection and performed during idle time in percent. And we see for some websites it works really well, like for ESPN up to 90%. On average, it's about 60% of the garbage collection time we're able to schedule during idle time, which is really nice. It's basically garbage collection getting for free. Not really free, but out of your way. Okay, so now let's look at memory. We also started to take advantage of idleness to reduce memory consumption. On the background thread, this is a bit easier. Um, there we just, let me start different. Let, let me start with the foreground thread. So I mentioned the heap growing strategy before, um, where we calculate basically from one GC to the next GC, the limit how far we are allowed to grow, right? And the assumption there is that the allocation rate is pretty constant over time. So we will eventually soon get to the next limit. And um, this is where the next garbage collection list triggers. But this is not really true on the web, right? What happens on the web is you have the page load, which is really heavy, for example, Gmail. A lot of objects get allocated. A lot of stuff gets prefetched. Um, this is really heavy on the VM. But suddenly you have your screen open and nothing happens anymore. And what will happen is you will end up with such a curve, right? You decided you want to grow. Page load happened down here, let's say. You want to grow until here. And suddenly Gmail is not doing much, right? So you end up with this curve. And you basically wait forever. Uh, to trigger the next garbage collection event, which is really bad. So what we started doing there is um, we basically look for a signal for the foreground thread um, to figure out if the tab is not doing much. And what worked quite well for us is looking at the allocation rate of an app. If this rate goes down, we say like, wow, this app is kind of not doing anything interesting anymore, at least from a JavaScript perspective. So we may want to clean up the memory. So we started to proactively schedule a full garbage collection and then try to finish the incremental marking steps fast, perform also more aggressive compaction to get rid of uh, fragmentation. Um, and you have to be really careful in the foreground thread, right? Because there you don't want to mess up the latency because of this explicit cleanup task. In the background thread, it's really nicer. You wait a quite some seconds. If we detect that the tab wasn't used for many, many seconds, well, schedule a garbage collection to get rid of memory. And you know, in V8, together with Blink, 
we need like to get rid of the memory of the whole transitive closure of both systems. We need a few GCs on, in both worlds to really clean up the whole memory. So by doing that, we can look at this demo here for Chimo. This is on the foreground tab. Um, by doing that, it significantly reduced the memory in Chromium. It reduced it way faster, right? This Chima really triggered this really bad case that we had a high limit, but never grew to that limit. It would have taken days, basically, to grow to that limit if Chima is not open. And we especially also saw it with the background tabs. So um, I forgot which one is the good version. The good version will be the version with less memory. Yeah, the left one. <laughs> <laughs> so you see the feature in action here. This one happily sits with this 140 max and will sit there forever. Um, and this one already got one GC. And it said um, the memory reduced the register to another garbage collection task. It kind of detects like, well, there will be more work to do if we schedule again. And now it kicked in again and reduced it to basically kind of half of the memory. And that worked really well for Gmail. Um, OK, that's a bit weird. It's up here. Oops. Let me reload. Oh, God. Sorry for that. Mm. You have to be really careful, though, to not to drain the battery, right? So the memory reducer has to be really carefully tuned to not kick in too often. Uh, we had this regression, like, where we happily, memory reducer kicked in happily every five seconds. The app was really not idle enough. So it always looked like idle, non-idle, idle, non-idle, non -idle, and they played happily ping pong. And your phone or your computer doesn't really like that. Overall, it resulted like on heavy Google products in a heavy Google products that sit idle for some time, take with that feature like use less than 40% less memory, which is really nice. Um, final challenge: we really like long-running benchmarks. Currently in the perfboards. The benchmarks are running too short to do some interesting work in terms of garbage collection. So what we really like is see more benchmarks coming up that are running for 30 seconds that do interesting action, maybe like Gmail, opening email, typing stuff, sending email, I don't know, real workloads of the web. And the infinite scrolling benchmarks I showed before is like the first step for us to basically get more interesting workloads, but we should do more of that. And what's what's really a tough one, and it's kind of a chicken and egg problem, when you look at the main websites out there, they do reasonably well, right? We optimize for them. They optimize to be fast on the web, right? So especially on mobile, not much allocation, not much garbage collection is going on for many websites. So it would be interesting to get like websites from the web of tomorrow to basically allow us to do more interesting optimization, to maybe flush out pain points earlier than later, and maybe allow with that a better website on the web. That's the end of my talk. Thank you very much. I'm happy to answer questions. Uh, really great talk. I mean, the, the Gmail results are incredible. Um, can I ask a question? It, it's not really related to you know V8 or GC, but it is related to memory. Mm -hmm. So uh, I work with a lot of customers, and obviously I'm an engineer on Chrome at Google. And uh, there's a lot of people running into out of memory crashes, right? I mean, Chrome security strategy for out of memory is all snap. There's no user visible stack trace, no user visible indication that it was in fact an out of memory error. And so I get a lot of requests, hey, can you please look up these crash IDs? And it's like, all right, here's your stack trace. You were crashing in, you know, plus equals, you know, a document dot inner HTML equals whatever, you know, interning a V8 string or something, or you were allocating a big type array. Uh, any ideas on how we can improve diagnostics for end users? in these situations, you know, at least like have dev tools have some signal that, hey, you ran out of memory. Because right now what happens is the target disconnects and you got no signal what actually happened. And oftentimes the allocation rate is so fast that they can't even see the run up in the memory trace up to the point of crash. And any ideas? I mean Are you asking what the web developer can do or the the end user can do? Well what the web developer can do. What okay. we can do for the web developer to improve, you know, their okay. ability to figure out what's going wrong. 
I think if the web developer sees that his app is regularly crashing, Chrome DevTools has some awesome tools there, right? You have to do, you can do heap snapshots and see if the snapshot is increasing, see what's going on there. Um, maybe it's not super obvious from a user perspective. Like I, I can do that with my low level knowledge. Um, the thing is the point in time when you're out of memory, that may not be the point in time where you really screwed up, right? If you hold on to a lot of live memory hooked up with other data structures and don't basically uh, break the link, um, any allocation in any of the subsystems may at one point trigger the out of memory scenario. So at that point, we can basically just give the feedback back. Um, was there a lot of memory held live in JavaScript, which basically means you're probably going to have somewhere a memory leak in JavaScript. Same for uh, Blink or the other allocators. So I think the out of memory reporting is a really, it's a really tough point to get more information there, except what all these spaces, what Primiano showed today, what all these spaces contain. Um, I think if you have problems with your memory consumption, use DevTools, try to get an allocation trace, try to get heap snapshots, see if they increase over time, and base your action on that. So w one, one thing you could do, um, since it's also us killing the process, we could kill it with um, a third signal. We already use terminate and illegal execution, and we, we could just use a third signal to kill it. So DevTools could at least show you, okay, like the, the process killed itself because out of, out of memory. You still wouldn't get the stack trace, like as, as Hannes explained. It's yeah. kind of difficult. I mean, yeah. what, actu what we actually don't do right now, we have it, uh, we dump it in the mini dump in a very dirty way. We put there like the memory sizes of all the spaces of TV tape. What, what might help is like what Premiano showed today, if you would get like this final sample of what happened on the heap. Maybe yeah, that's yeah. a good clue, but what would be a nice starting point for you to look at next. I mean, I think that we should talk more uh, about that because DevTools isn't working, at least it wasn't working for me when I tried it on these test cases. Okay. You know, I got no final sample. Uh, you know, the, the allocation rate was so high that yeah. you couldn't actually get viable oh, heap snapshots while the thing yeah. was running, and then boom, you're dead. So yeah. I think we need to, need to make this more easily Absolutely. diagnosable yes. by end users. Good idea, yeah. So if you are inside of a scavenger task, is it possible to um, have like an interruptible signal that, you know, because you're determining how long your scavenger, how long of the graph you're scavenging for, right? Is it possible to have some signal uh, by another thread saying that, you know what, you probably should interrupt and give back your idle time, uh, specifically for like input? Uh, so are you asking, is your question, is it possible to interrupt the GC and resume later? Uh, whether there are certain phases that, that a signal like that would be useful. So that's really tough to implement. Like uh, when a GC is going on, especially a scavenge, you are basically in a broken state from a JavaScript heap perspective. The only thing is what you could do is like stop scavenge, resume another Chrome process, basically do it on a process level, um, but you cannot execute any JavaScript operation when GC is currently running. So. Um, but if you if you see like some other inputs events are coming in, um, right, basically like the Blink scheduler would have to like an operating system scheduler step in, deschedule the garbage collection task from a processor perspective, and resume some other task. Yeah, like for example, if you were if you were in the middle of doing something, you could conceive that it it'd be more useful just to abort what you're doing, than than to continue on. Yeah, so that's right. The Okay, like, uh, aborting uh, JavaScript uh, GC task not, is not possible. It, it's not, not no. in the current You already you are, have, are in an inconsistent memory state. You would have to reverse whatever you did, which yep. is probably m more expensive than uh, the work that is pending. Yeah. Um, how is the idle time like identified? Like you basically have to look into the future to know, right? Like, oh, you're going to be idle for this much time. It's a good time for the GC to, to kick in. Like, how does that? So uh, the Blink scheduler has a global notion of what's going on in the system, and if um, there are no inputs events coming or like high priority events that have to be run on top of the Blink scheduler, it will know, like an operating system scheduler, um, there will be idle time, and then it will just spawn off one of these idle tasks with a V8 job. And the VHO promises that it will return before the given idle time. 
But you know, it's it's the best effort. It's not hard real time system. Um, sometimes we overshoot. We try to not overshoot too much. Um, and then when that idle time is identified, and you know you do the garbage collection, then this sounds conceptually similar to that bad idea you mentioned earlier, where like users are like, hey, I know I have some idle time. Why don't we go ahead and do the garbage collection now? Um, how how is it uh, okay for the scheduler and not okay for the user? Because the user doesn't know what's going on really in the system, right? The okay. user has no idea how fast the render is. Where there you are in the frame time, right? It's it's really the user just knows about on that level from JavaScript perspective, right? And it might know that soon we will do some rendering, but um, it doesn't know about how long garbage collection takes, right? These are all internal information. Hmm. Um, so it, in that sense, it's very different. And if there's no idle time in the system, because maybe the hardware is slower, like on ARM on mobile devices, or if there's long time no idle time. There will be no idle GC, basically, right? Okay. Thanks. Uh, recently, we've been seeing uh, ads produce really gigantic GCs, <coughs> and they don't understand how to take action on them. And I know it's difficult, but it'd be really nice if there was a mode where it told you the specific types of objects that were freed with like lots of detail, like the the function, the, if it's a class, like the type, if it's a string, what the contents were, um, even if it's high overhead, because some ads you have anywhere from 50 to 100 millisecond GCs on phones, and when we showed it to them and they said, ah, oh, that seems really bad, but we have no idea what to do about it, mm -hmm. and so they just taking a heap snapshot didn't tell them like what they were creating so much of and then discarding. And they really wanted a mode where they, it would tell them, like, object counts or something. There's like the allocation profile in DevTools as well, which is the heap snapshot will just give you the live objects, right? Which is problematic. Mm -hmm. The allocation trace will give you all allocated objects. Maybe the, maybe the tooling is not there really for the users. Uh, I think that that's a really good point. We should have a look there together with maybe DevTools, V8, and, and end users and understand the problems and help them out and make make it better for them, yeah. Totally agree. Okay, thank you.